Good afternoon and uh, welcome. It's my distinct pleasure to uh, uh, introduce you to this year's Leon C. and June W. Holt Lecture in International Law, in which we'll have a unique opportunity to hear from an elected member of the Ukrainian parliament. Uh, George tells me it's called Rada in Ukrainian. Is that right? Uh, I'm going to mangle whatever I'm supposed to say that's in Ukrainian. I just want to put that out there right now. Uh, but in any event, uh, a, a member of the Ukrainian parliament, Alexei Goncharenko. Uh, Mr. Goncharenko is based in Kyiv, Ukraine, and is on a visit to the United States. Uh, we're very grateful and lucky that he's had the opportunity to come to Penn and share his firsthand knowledge both uh, as a political leader in RADA um, that continues to perform its important role without interruption since the time of the Russian invasion and as a person living with his family under missile strike in Ukraine. Uh, to begin with, I want to uh, acknowledge that we're here today due to the joint cooperation of two Penn institutions. The first is the Holt Lecture Series. The series was inaugurated in 2007 through the efforts of distinguished Penn Law alum Leon Holt, uh, who was a member of the class of 1951. Leon Holt was a business executive who worked for 33 years at Air Products and Chemicals, a major global chemical company, serving in, among other roles, the company's general counsel and vice chairman. With Leon's commitment to international affairs uh, uh, as a business executive, his career took him around the world. Uh, it led him to develop a deep interest in international affairs, international business, and international policy. That interest and his committed belief that his worldview was broadened by the time that he spent living and working in Europe and Africa, that was the genesis for the Holt Lectures. Uh, the Holt Lecture Series brings leaders and experts from around the world uh, to Penn Law to impart their knowledge and experience and to further the law school's goal of fostering cross-disciplinary legal education. Uh, Leon Holt's legacy is continued this afternoon, uh, and we're very happy to have his grandson, Michael Weil, uh, Penn Law Class of 2012 here. Uh, just a personal note, uh, Michael was in my securities regulation class in 2012, uh, so it's particularly special for me to have him here. Uh, he survived uh, securities regulation, although he tells me he hasn't used a lick of it ever since. <laughs> Um, Mr. Goncharenko joins a distinguished group of past Holt Lecture speakers uh, who include Ernesto Zedillo, former president of Mexico, Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, Chief Justice Dorit Bainish of the Supreme Court of Israel, the Honorable Ngozi Okonjo Iwalu, uh, Director General of the World Trade Organization, and Sandy Okoro, Senior Vice President and General Counsel for the World Bank Group. Uh, now, this afternoon's Holt Lecture is extra special because it's jointly hosted by Penn's Institute for Law and Economics, or what we call ILE. ILE is housed at the law school, but it's essentially a collaboration of Penn Law, Wharton, and the uh, University Department of Economics. It's more or less our business law center. It was founded 35 years ago, and Leon Holt was one of the founding members. Uh, of a group of practitioners, uh, business people, and judges who serve at, on ILE's Board of Advisors and whose mission is to bring to Penn academics and practitioners to discuss timely and cutting-edge issues relevant to the business law community. I think you'll agree with me that today's lecture t fairly uh, uh, fits squarely within that theme. The ILE connection is important because Mr. Gocherenko would not be here today without the work of ILE board member George Casey, who's been instrumental in making this program possible. George is the global managing partner of Sherman and Sterling, where he's been recognized as one of the leading M&A lawyers in the world. He's received recognition as an M&A super all-star, a deal maker of the year, and a transatlantic corporate deal maker. Students at Penn have been enriched by this expertise through the popular cross-border M&A course that George has, George has taught here at the law school for a number of years. As a Ukrainian-American, George has been at the forefront of supporting Ukraine and of the legal industry's response to the invasion. George, thank you for all your service to Penn and for bringing Mr. Gocherenko here to us today. 
A few quick housekeeping points before I turn the proceedings over to George, who will formally introduce Mr. Goncharenko. Uh, first, we'll be handing out cards and pens for the attendees to write down questions for the speaker during the Q&A period, and staff will come around to pick those up. Please have them ready. Uh, note that today's talk will be recorded and added to the law school's YouTube channel for later viewing. Who knew the law school had, had a YouTube channel? Learn something every day. Uh, finally, we're offering CLE credit for today's talk. Uh, you will get two CLE passcodes. The first CLE passcode is Parliament, and I'm supposed to say that twice. So the first CLE password is Parliament. See how, how coachable I am? <laughs> and now that concludes my housekeeping remarks. Please join me in welcoming George Casey. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for such a kind introduction, Jill. Um, so I am thrilled to introduce to you uh, Oleksiy Honcherenko, a uh, member of Ukrainian parliament, Verkhovna Rada. You, you were absolutely right, Jill, and your pronunciation was perfect. Um, Oleksiy has been in parliament now for eight years. Um, Alexei, please, um, for eight years. So uh, I was, uh, when we first met, uh, I was tempted to uh, call him young, but uh, with eight years of experience in parliament and being one of the uh, political leaders in the country, one of the most experienced pol political leaders in the countries, calling him young is just not right and not fair. Uh, but Alexei is the but past- But you can call me. <laughs> <laughs> is the past, present, and future of uh, Ukrainian political uh, democratic life. Uh, Alexei, um, was born in Odessa. Uh, his family, uh, his uh, wife and kids are in Odessa now. Um, and Oleksiy initially, when the war started, was in territorial defense, um, defending Kiev uh, during the invasion with uh, a, a rifle in his hands. Uh, and then he returned to his parliamentary duties uh, and parliament, by the way, continues to function. It's a true democracy, and all the democratic institutions are working in Ukraine. Uh, Oleksiy is also a member of the Ukrainian delegation uh, to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of um, Europe. Uh, and actually, before coming to the U.S., he was in Strasbourg at the session of uh, uh, PACE. Uh, he was also at Davos uh, before that. Um, uh, he is a very active uh, political leader. Uh, he is a great speaker and writer uh, med uh, with a degree in medicine, actually, and practicing emergency medicine years ago. Uh, Oleksiy uh, speaks four languages fluently, uh, writes. I, I love writing his, uh, his uh, postings, uh, and he posts on Twitter. By the way, if anybody wants to follow Twitter, Telegram, um, YouTube, a number of others. Um, he's also like and share. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, that's, that's important. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, Oleksiy is also founding, uh, uh, f I guess, a founder of Goncharenko Center, uh, which is a, a number of centers uh, throughout Ukraine, an NGO uh, in Ukraine that's promoting education uh, free of charge to those who are participating, trying to reach as far into the Ukrainian community as possible outside even of large cities. So uh, very, very happy that uh, Oleksiy can be here. Uh, two words about the, the lecture, uh, the lecture itself. Uh, live free or die, right? Those important words uh, stemming from American Revolution, now important uh, in this day and age, believe, believe it or not, uh, I cannot believe myself, in 21st century, again important, in faraway land from the US, in Ukraine, uh, this is the war that Ukraine has no choice but to win. The world actually has no choice but to win this war against Russia. This is a war of evil against good. This is the war of totalitarianism against a young democracy. By the way, I'll pause here. Uh, Russia was never a democracy, even if you would say that Yeltsin's years in the 90s was a bit of a thaw, it was not a true democracy. Ukraine actually has a very long democratic tradition going back to 1600s, believe it or not, before Russia started colonizing Ukraine in, uh, after 1654 treaty. Uh, Ukraine still continued to elect its leaders all the way until 1720s when Russia stopped it. Uh, so that democracy uh, has been brought back and that democracy is still young at 30 years old now, but it is a democracy. It's truly functioning democracy. It's also um, the war of chauvinism against um, 
people who want to say that we want to be ourselves, we want to be Ukrainians. Russia is denying it, and Alexei will be talking about it. Russia effectively is denying uh, Ukraine's right to be a state, a right to be a nation. Just listen to Putin's speech if you're interested two days before the invasion, what he said. He said, Ukrainian nation does not exist. Ukraine is artificial creation. Ukrainian language, the language of poets, uh, of philosophers, of writers, it's just a vernacular dialect, forget about it. And final point, it's the war of lies against truth. Uh, Russia is actually the only state in the world, the only country in the world where lies are brought to state level, where there are state agencies that are in charge of developing them and promoting them. And those lies, uh, some of them are openly communicated, some of them are placed surreptitiously, um, and you can find them actually everywhere. You know, I'll mention just two and then let Alexei speak. One is that uh, Russian-speaking population is prosecuted uh, in Ukraine, and that's the reason for, uh, for this war. Oleksiy can speak from his background, I can speak from my family's background. Not the case. I've been speaking with my uh, wife's family for several decades. Russian, there is no issue with Russian speakers. Oleksiy grew up speaking Russian. Um, uh, the, the, other, um, uh, the, the other big, big lie is that um, uh, uh, and, and this one is done both directly and surreptitiously, is that, well, it's a small regional conflict. Everybody stays away. Uh, there is a territorial conflict in, U in Ukraine. Let uh, Russia and, and Ukraine sort it out. And we can see actually some of the US politicians, some of the European politicians, Kind of repeating that line effectively that, well, let, let have them sort it out. Maybe Ukraine needs to cede some territories. But let's remember that there is international law and we are in 21st century. There is a 1991 treaty that Russia, Ukraine and Belarus signed and which Russia recognized Ukraine within its territorial borders that include Crimea and include Donbass. There is 1994 treaty that uh, 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 Russia, Ukraine, US and UK are parties to. And that treaty, uh, when Ukraine, agreed to give up its nuclear weapons. That treaty said that the parties recognize territorial integrity of each other, will not use force or threat of force against territorial integrity. So look what's happening now, notwithstanding the treaty. By the way, I remind everybody, US is a guarantor. So US is acting actually as um, in, in accordance with its obligations among uh, just other things, among providing humanitarian help. So again, Ukraine will need to win this war. The world will need to, will, uh, to win this war because we cannot let evil uh, exist. Live free or die. Oleksiy Goncharenko, member of Ukrainian parliament. I'm thrilled that he can be here and, and talk to you today. Oleksiy. Thank you very much. First of all, first of all, thank you very much, George, for your so great and too kind introduction. Uh, but that was absolutely great. Thank you. Second, I want to thank the University of Pennsylvania. For me, it's a great honor to be here today and to speak with you. And I want to thank everybody, all of you who came today, who decided to devote some time to listen about Ukraine. I hope that in the end you will not say that was a wasted time. We will try, uh, and if any of you will have any questions to me after, will want to speak personally, I will be absolutely happy and delighted to do this. So please feel free. But, you know, I, I think that we should start maybe with a little bit uh, of understanding of atmosphere about what's going on now in, in, in Europe, uh, in general, in the world. Uh, first, I want to remind you for a second, how did you wake up today? Yeah, just, just for the second, just how it was, I don't know, in your, maybe a guest at your house with your loved one or with your cat, I don't know. But just for a second, I want to show you how you, millions of Ukrainians, including my wife and two of my kids who are now in Odessa, woke up. I think it's clear that it is air raid signal, and that is how almost one year 
uh, all Ukrainians are waking up and going to the bed, and that's how we live. And I think this is uh, the sound, not of just for Ukrainians of, uh, of to be cautious about danger, but it's about the whole world to be in danger, and the whole free world to be in danger. And uh, that's why it's so important what's going on today in Ukraine, and what lessons we can make from what is happening. So, yeah, live free or die. I really believe in this, and I think this is the crucial, the crucial lesson of what's going on today. So, uh, what happens now in Ukraine? This is the war of free world against dictatorships. We have good news. Free world is winning. That is very important, and we are winning. But we should do it quicker, with less price, uh, and to make lessons from it. Why it's happening in Ukraine? The question. Why this is a historical moment, something which will define how the world will develop next decades, when you will live your life, when you will build uh, your future, your career. Why in Ukraine? It's all about money and the power again, you know. Because for centuries and decades, Ukraine was overshadowed by Russia. And the world did not realize how many things in the, in, in the world were dependent from our country. Ukraine is the largest agro-industrial country in the world. Uh, Ukraine has built the largest airplane in the world. Sorry, with all respect to great United States of America, we built bigger airplane. It was called Maria, which is, called, which is in translation dream. This dream is now destroyed by Russia, because it was staying near Kiev in the airport, but we will rebuild our dream. Technologies, Ukrainian technologies, high technologies, for example, for production of supersonic plane edge engines. Uh, Ukraine is the most development IT country in Europe with the biggest IT staff. Ukraine has the largest capacity, in, uh, transit capacity in Europe. Ukraine is the key to control the Black Sea. And I think many forgot that the Black Sea was the breadbasket of civilized world from the time of ancient Greece. And when Putin closed the Black Sea, everybody on the planet felt it. Somebody with the picking prices in supermarket, but somebody starving, like in Africa, in other countries, starving to death. That's what happened, and Putin did it absolutely consciously and deliberately. And now Ukraine is the strongest army on European continent. Why Putin attacked Ukraine, one of the reasons, because if you will see the the, the cycle of uh, imperial cycle, and it's clear in Russia. 20 years ago, we will, I will not go to some faraway historical times. 20 years ago, Russia finally suppressed Chechnya, which is a small part, uh, which is a small country in North Caucasus, which, were, which tried to be independent, and Russia suppressed them. To do this, they killed one of five Chechens. One from five. So from one million of Chechen people, they killed 200,000. There's a clear genocide, which they did. The whole world was silent. They did it in 2000. And now, unborn in 2000, Chechen boys are fighting in Ukraine and killing Ukrainians. In 2008, Russia invaded Georgia, one more country in North Caucasus. Uh, they took Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and now Abkhazian and South Ossetian boys at that time, now they're fighting, these young men now fighting in uh, uh, Ukraine, against Ukraine. In 2014, Russia occupied Crimea and part of Donbas, part of Ukrainian territory. And now they're taking young men from Donbas and Crimea and sending them to die, to kill Ukrainians, their compatriots, and to die. Why Ukraine is needed by this empire? Because Ukraine is millions of young men like you here in this auditorium, to take them to go against Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, and other countries. That is how empire works, and that's why Ukraine is important. So what are the lessons for the free world from the war in Ukraine? I believe these are three. Dominate in values, dominate in the economy, dominate in military potential. Because without this, you are you can be a victim of these dictatorships, and not even can be, you will be. Because all this situation showed that dictatorship cannot be contained inside its borders. Sooner or later, evil will go out and will attack. 
That is clear, and the world should be prepared and strong enough. Values. I said about values, and really I believe in this. I believe in values. Democracy matters. Democracy, freedom, rule of law, human rights, market economy. That is real basis of our civilization, and that, that what matters. And these values are also very pragmatic, what we saw in Ukraine. One example, rule of law. You, we are here in law school. Uh, just watch it, this. This is Russian army against Ukrainian army. This is a uniform. I could take even more striking picture. This is probably one of the best units of Russian army. Russian army, and Putin invested in Russian army during 20 years more than $1,000 billion during 20 years. Ukraine, during this time, we invested near $50 billion. We have, we have, better, we have better uniform, we have better uh, food in our army, and that is what about corruption what corruption can do. And you can clearly see it here. Because democracy matters and rule of law matters. Economy, that is a very important theme. Uh, here, famous business school, Wharton, uh, and I think that is one, again, a lesson to business community. You, many of you will work in business. I really believe that the free world cannot be dependent from not free world. We saw it in our country. Ukraine was dependent from oil, gas, from Russia, and from Belarus, that was like a transitional point. And the moment the, war, the invasion started, all this was stopped, as you can imagine. So all these dictatorships, they are weaponizing everything. They are weaponizing energy, they are weaponizing food, so dependence is dangerous. Germany and Europe in general was dependent from Russian energy sources and now they have a lot of problems and the whole Europe has these problems. Today United States in some areas are dependent from China. This is a danger. This is the threat. You should understand this. And uh, speaking about like for me we're saying about well, clean energy Definitely, I am absolutely pro-environment, and I want to see uh, not fossil fuel used, but, uh, but, uh, but sun, uh, wind, uh, and, and so on. But the first thing about clean energy, it is the energy from clean countries, from countries with clean co governments. That is very important. I really believe in this. Because that's from what everything started. Dictatorships, they don't care about nature. They don't care about environment because they don't care about people in the first place. So they don't need to think about animals or plants or, or, or good air. And we can see it. So the first thing, if we want to save our nature, if we want to have clean energy, is to have a world order. That is something we should remember. Uh, the best markets are free markets. Because the markets with rule of law are the markets where, uh, where, where you can work. Because when you are coming to corrupted countries, then came, uh, taking corrupted money, this, then taking it back here, you are also taking this corruption here, and that is a threat. Uh, so I really think that what's going on in Ukraine showed to the world that doing business with dictatorial regimes is always more expensive. Military potential is important. Just one example, Ukraine received from the United States weaponry, high marses, javelins, it's from 1990s. And uh, with this we stopped Russian army. In general, uh, United States invested 3% of its military budget to Ukraine. And with this we destroyed 50% of Russian military capacity in conventional weaponry. It's extremely effective investment. But we need to be strong enough. I, you know, I've been, uh, when I, like George said, when I was in France in, for the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, I saw a rally of people saying we should demilitarize France. And it sounds very good, for, especially for young people. Let us make love, not war, and uh, uh, all these. And I am also for this. <laughs> but I want to tell you that these people who are saying let's demilitarize France or demilitarize the United States, it's a wishful thinking because the world is not so easy. And there are countries, Putin will be happy to see demilitarized United States, France, and everything. And he will come. That will be a beautiful life, but not long. So that is something we should remember. Uh, that is something about Ukrainian technologies, but the main topic of the lecture and my, well, the summary. 
is that tyrants, they can't coexist with free world. And the lesson is, we can't tolerate evil. If even we think that it's somewhere far away, it's a lesson for us, Ukrainians. I told you about Belarus, which is occupied now by Russia, but before there was a dictatorship there by a man called Lukashenko. Uh, that is an awful dictatorship. And uh, people tried three years ago to uprise there. Uh, they were unsuccessful, unfortunately. I uh, chair in Ukrainian parliament caucus for free Belarus. Many of my colleagues were telling, why are you doing this? I mean, like, it's Belarus. It's like Belarusian people, they should, if that's okay for them, if not, they will uprise. I was telling, no, it's an evil. They're killing people there. There is no democracy. That's a problem. Oh, no, we can trade with them. No, we don't care. The reality, one more country is Iran. I, was heard, I heard the same. Iran is far away from Ukraine. Where is on the map? Why we should care about Iran? Let them do with their women what they want. Oh, I mean, like, that is their life. No, it, it doesn't work like this. After all this, now we receive Iranian drones on our heads from Belarusian territory. That is the lesson. If there is an evil, sooner or later it will come to you. You can't tolerate it. You just need to be strong enough, but also you just need to do everything you can to, 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 to defeat the evil. And either the free world will expand our oh, dictatorships will expand. There is no other option. We, some, sometime in, in, in the history of humankind, either the whole planet will be free, or the whole planet will be under some crazy tyrants. That is, uh, the, that is the lesson, and that is something we should know and remember. Uh, and never we can speak about, you know, the world in 2014, tried to appease Putin by, like, when Putin attacked Ukraine, to Crimea, the world said that it was a signal from the West to Ukraine not to fight. Let us have a peace. And in reality, the thinking under was, okay, let us give Putin something, you know. He wants Crimea. Okay, let him take Crimea and let us move ahead and do business as usual with Russia and so on. It doesn't work this way. Because tyrants, they are geopolitical maniacs. You can't tell. Let us give a maniac one woman. Okay, one woman. And, and, and he will stop. First of all, we have values and we are humans. But secondly, he will never stop. This is the hunger. In one month, he will need more another woman, then another, then another, then another, and he will never stop before he would be stopped. That's what should be done, and I really believe in this. Uh, so what should we do to do it? The first step to live in free is defeat Russia together. We can do it now. We are on the way. But I want to ask you to continue to support our country. Again, that is very good investment from the United States. That is about values. That is about future. We should do this quicker. I hope that next decisions about weaponry will be made quicker. Because when we are receiving patriots in some months, I am so frustrated to know why we have not received them earlier. Because that would save th lives in Ukraine. The, our power grid would not be attacked. My family, as millions of Ukrainians, will not be now deprived from basics. We don't have electricity very often. We are we're deprived from running water sometimes. We don't have heating in the winter. That's what's going on. It, it could be prevented with weaponry. So more weaponry to Ukraine. Yeah, now we're speaking about F-16, Atacams, other weaponry. That's really needed. And by the way, that is a chance for Russian people too. Just for your understanding, in Russia, 10% of people don't have centralized sanitation toilets in their houses. So they need to go out. This is the richest country in the world from the point of view of resources. And in 21st century, they live in such poverty because, of, because they are all the time victims of some tyrants. Like, who benefited more from denazification than Germany? Germany became a wonderful, prosperous country with a wonderful life, but only after they were denazified de de in, after 1945. Uh, and now they are great. And there is chance for Russian people too, but that will start with the victory over Russian Empire. 
Uh, one thing uh, it was said by George, we are doing our best. Uh, I, I run the network of centers. Uh, we, we started the center, today is our anniversary of Goncharenko centers, uh, these days, um, two years ago we started. And uh, that idea was to give education to those who in need, free of charge, English language, to give possibility to people, ch children, teenagers to learn English, maybe then come to University of Pennsylvania or other universities with free courses, different other things. We continue our educational programs, but today we also, with the whole country, collecting money, to helping our army, helping refugees, and we will continue to do this. By the way, I hope we will do it also, continue our educational programs with the University of Pennsylvania. We're now discussing it. And maybe also you, as a students, will be interested in to take part in this program. We will be absolutely delighted in this. This is information about us. This is contact information. If anybody of you wants, you can make a photo of your or oh, I will leave it now on the screen so you can take any contacts. I would be absolutely happy to, to be in touch with uh, all of you. Once again, thank you for coming. That is something which is really important. Let's defeat evil together and let's build a better world for the next generation starting from yours. Thank you very much and I will be absolutely happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. Thank you. So uh, while we're waiting for the audience to collect some questions, I think we have a message from Dean Ruger, who can't be here, but has a recorded video uh, to welcome you. So if we can play that, uh, we'll be collecting questions. If you're watching on the internet, please submit your questions and they will be texted to me so I can ask them from the podium. I wish I could be there in person. That's the gym. Joining you is one of the crowds on. Where I am with Professor Eric Feldman, meeting with law schools, law firms, uh, alumni here, and then in Nigeria later this week. Uh, to this theme of international connection uh, that this lecture has honored for years. Um, the whole lecture in international law celebrates the career and influence of our distinguished graduate, Dion Holt, who um, had a career in international business, their products and chemical company. Uh, knowing full well how connected our world is and how important uh, an understanding of other countries and of our international regimes uh, are to success in any avenue that our graduates take. Uh, we're so glad uh, today to have a distinguished member of the Ukrainian parliament, Alexei Gonsharenko, joining us and sharing his words of wisdom. Thank you, Mr. Gonsharenko for coming uh, to the Penn Law School. I wish I could be there to welcome you, and I'm very pleased to be there with my colleagues in Philadelphia. Thank you also to George Casey, our uh, longtime magic professor, and my faculty, colleagues, and staff who have organized and welcomed this lecture so well. So the end sent you with full enthusiasm. Welcome to the whole lecture, uh, and uh, thank you to our speaker for being on campus today. So thanks, Ted. For those who don't know me, I'm Bill Burkwhite, Professor of International Law here. Um, I've spent uh, a good deal of time over the years in Ukraine and in Kiev, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, and delighted to see your very strong defense of the power of values and democracy. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions that have been handed from, from the audience. I don't have names, so I can't attribute them. But the first question I want to ask you picks up on some of what you mentioned about the importance of energy in, uh, in Ukraine today. And Russia, as it clearly realized that it couldn't simply take over the territory of Ukraine, has been more and more turning to the weaponization of energy. It has uh, launched attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Um, and I have a couple of questions about that. First, uh, what more should we be doing to protect Ukraine's energy infrastructure? 
Second, how should we respond to this weaponization of energy more broadly? Should we be thinking about changing the $60 cap on uh, the purchase price of Russian oil to something closer to the $30 production price of that oil? Uh, or what else can we do to respond to this very dangerous trend uh, of the weaponization of energy? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Russia is weaponizing everything. They weaponize in food, as I told you, so absolutely, deliberately, consciously provoking chaos in the world, social unrest. They weaponize in energy. What can be done? More air defense to Ukraine. It's very easy. It's not the time, you know, when we can, by words, stop the missiles, unfortunately. We need Patriots. We need F-16s. We need them more. We need them quicker. Uh, I already told a little bit about this. Uh, if we would receive it earlier, we would save big part of our power grid. Unfortunately, now it's a bit too late, but never too late. I mean, so better later than never. So we hope that we will receive it soon. Uh, and speaking about uh, energy in general, once again, I want to uh, underline it. Uh, free world should be self-sufficient in energy, and also that, that is important, and uh, that should be developed. And definitely we should continue to, to, to decrease Russian revenues from energy, because from these revenues they are sponsoring this war. Without this money they couldn't do this. So today price cap is 60, we want to see it coming then to 40, that is the immediate ask of Ukrainian government to our partners which is uh, on the consideration now. And George, let me bring you in on this topic for a minute because you advise some of the largest multinationals in, in the world and curious sort of what you think could or should be done with the international business community and particularly uh, the oil business community to make sure that those price caps really work and aren't uh, evaded. Yeah, it's, it's in a, an important uh, topic, Bill, and obviously what Alexei is doing, what the uh, that what other people are doing, it's making sure that the business community understands actually what is going on in Ukraine. Um, uh, Ukrainian Americans, uh, uh, Ukra Ukrainians living in, in Europe, uh, other people are talking about this. Um, uh, and, you know, I think business community overall, it took, it took time for uh, not only business community generally, for international community to understand what's going on. Uh, actually, uh, I would say that uh, the world learned more about Ukraine over the last 11 months than probably in many decades before that. When I came to this country, you know, and people would ask me, where are you from? And I would say, I'm Ukrainian. They would say, oh, so you're Russian. I would say, no, no, actually, I'm <laughs> Ukrainian. But uh, there was no, no real distinction. So I, th I think uh, uh, the community understands. Um, uh, there are still businesses that are continuing to do business in Russia. Um, it's important to, for them to understand what's, what's happening. Their dollars, the euro, uh, are going actually to finance this war. Um, uh, on energy security itself, you know, Alexei's point that self-sufficiency is very important. And also for people to understand that, um, uh, as, as Alexei put it, clean energy uh, not only comes from clean sources in, in a sense of how it's produced, but also where, they are, where this energy is produced. And so, so that part is very, very important for everybody to understand. Thanks, George. Alexei, I want to turn to a different part of your talk, and that's about democracy. One of our questions asks about the role of information and disinformation in a democracy. Uh, it's something we've had to deal with here in the United States as well. But in Russia today, there is a vast amount of disinformation. Uh, that may explain some of Putin's resilience. Uh, but I guess I'm wondering what we can do to make sure we're getting good information about what's happening on the ground and how we can combat the danger of disinformation that seems to be fueling the, the Russian propaganda machine or fueled by, I should say, the Russian propaganda machine. Absolutely. Uh, the first war is here. That is the first and the most important battlefield on which do, do dictatorships work. They try. Russia has a lot of experience in propaganda for, for, for decades. And uh, that is the mo I think that is the most important war. But the, the best sources of information, definitely it's my Twitter. It's like, no, no, <laughs> no questions about it. It's in, in English. Uh, 
Yeah, but uh, sure, there are a lot of sources of information, uh, and and we can uh, and you can use it. But yeah, you should always be uh, cautious because even in the United States of America, like for example, I can give you uh, there is a Tucker Carlson show with some speaking when speaking about Ukraine. It's about very strange things said there, and I and I try to reach Tucker Carlson saying that I want to come to your show. If it is a freedom of speech and you are a journalist, so let, let's give us possibility to give a second opinion to what you are saying. Uh, unfortunately, for the moment, it's like no answer. But I will continue to do this because I really believe that we, we, we need to address such things. Because all these conspiracy theories and other things, that is something which is feeding the dictatorships, which is making these narratives then to, then, then to justify awful things that they are doing, genocide and other things. So that is a very important question, and uh, I think more should be done in the world in order to fight the propaganda. And, Bill, if, if I may uh, add maybe to what Alexei said, um, what, what we teach in law school, right, is critical thinking, and that actually is key to trying to distinguish between information and disinformation. Uh, Think for yourselves, right? Think whether what you're hearing is true or not true. Uh, again, as, as we all are learning and, and teaching uh, at the law school, um, uh, you know, sometimes you can see that um, media that's well-intentioned uh, or uh, an analyst who is actually innocent in the way they think, they do not uh, look at things critically, and then they, they take uh, some information that may be actually planted to them, right, or information they're hearing somewhere, and then uh, spread out. If you look actually, uh, some very respected organizations, I believe, was it Human Rights Watch that recently put out uh, just a couple yeah. of days ago mm -hmm. that Ukraine is uh, uh, Ukrainian government, right, and Ukrainian army, uh, our armed forces are the ones that are you know, planting the most mines. But just think why, why there are so many mines in Ukraine. Ukraine is under attack. Of course, of course, the armed forces are putting mines. But you know how the same information may be used and twisted, um, uh, and again, by some highly respected organizations. Uh, that's where critical thinking is important. Mm -hmm. How you take that information is very, very important. May I add a little? Uh, sorry if I will just take time. But uh, I mean, like. Uh, We're here to listen to you, so don't be you. sorry. Thank you. So, but it's important because. Uh, first of all, about uh, these narratives. I mean, here, here in University of Pennsylvania, just before coming to you, I met with a number of professors, and one of them asked me about Nazis in Ukraine. Just about Nazis that are prevailing and uh, they're here, not somewhere else. But I said, uh, we have a Jewish president. How in your head it can be combined? like Nazi country and Jewish president. I mean, like, what is it? So it's so obvious, it's so clear disinformation, but still when it's a Goebbels principle, if you will repeat the, the lie 100 times, mm -hmm. people will believe in it. Just continue repeating, repeat, 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 that, and then you will have result. So that is something which is striking. I mean, how it can be, uh, Oh, I, I can give you another example. In Odessa, I know a lady whose mother lives in uh, Transnistria, which is occupied part of Moldova, because Russia is doing this, all this chaos for decades. And there is also part of Moldova occupied by them. And her mother lives there. And there is a lot of Russian propaganda there. But the, by the way, less than in Russia itself, but still a lot. Mm -hmm. And when the war started, February 24, she called her mother saying that like rockets are falling. She said, oh, no, 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 it's everything okay. They're just coming to defend you. She, I mean, like, she said, mom, mommy, that's me. Yeah. Rockets are falling on my head. She said, no, 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 it's everything's okay. You, you, just, you, you just don't know the truth. That's how propaganda can be effective. We should always remember this. We should always remember. You know, while we're talking about democracy and information versus disinformation, you know, Ukraine um, went through a revolution, you might call it the Orange Revolution, a moment of, uh, uh, of, of some see as a democratic moment. Russia has characterized this as a coup, not a democratic moment. And how do we know the difference? How do we know what is real democracy, what really is representative of the people, and what's 
the disinformation side of the story. That moment is seen very differently in Ukraine than it certainly is in, in the halls of the Kremlin. Uh, yeah, I, I think one of the things is about rule of law. Because everything that happened in Ukraine in 2014 was according to rule of law. Uh, when Ukrainian president, uh, who became a traitor, ran away from the country, he did it, ran away deliberately. Mm. Nobody was, he was pushing him out. He did it. At that moment, our constitution says we need another president. We can't live without a president who, who ran away from the country. And that is the head of the parliament. And then the head of the parliament took the... So what is the coup? Coup d'etat, they are saying. Where is it? I mean, what is it? Because for Putin, any democratical movement is coup d'etat, definitely. Then we had elections which were recognized by the whole world. And in Russia itself, they were telling that there is a new Ukrainian president mm -hmm. elected by people. So what, 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 is the, what is the point? So just critical thinking and, and, and yeah, rule of law, things like this, which is clear for, for people like you, future bright lawyers. And I would say, you know, the word coup is exactly an example of uh, taking the word, right, and then planting it and saying that, well, the coup in Ukraine, and then we have psychologically the immediate image of, of the coup. But uh, in my mind, you know, the big difference uh, between the, uh, the, there is a big difference between when it's a coup where a dictator is taking power, destroys democracy, and that's a coup, right? It's uh, that dictator puts uh, himself in, uh, or herself, well, typically himself uh, in place. Uh, what was happening in Ukraine, as uh, Alexei was describing, uh, people actually were protesting. Uh, uh, look, uh, at, at the time, the, the Ukrainian uh, uh, president uh, Yanukovych uh, and his forces were killing, shooting at people and killing them. And then he fled the country. So there was no dictator who came to, to power. It, it was actually Ukrainian civil society asserting themselves against uh, what was becoming a more totalitarian uh, features of the presidential administration of the time. So, so um, that's where you know, the big distinc distinction is. So I want to switch to another element of your theme of your talk, which is the military side. Um, and, and your point about saying let's demilitarize the world is a lovely one, uh, but, but hard to realize. And, and we're lawyers, so knowing whether an Attackums or an F-16 is going to make a difference may, may be hard for us. But I think there is at least one person who's asked a question about the risk of nuclear escalation. Oh, yeah. And that there is a concern that as you know, Biden's red lines on what he's willing to do for Ukraine have moved a long way. Um, and I think there was a fear that if he had initially said, I'll send M1 Abrams tanks to Ukraine, Putin might have responded by elevating. Thankfully, we haven't seen that happen. But what do you say to people who are worried that the continuation or elevation of Western military support might lead to a nuclear response from Russia? Absolutely great question. First of all, but first I will start with this, that sending Abrams or Patriots will move to Putin, the escalate situation to nuke. But why it, it could move the situation to nukes in summer, but in January the decision <laughs> was made? So, mm -hmm. I, something doesn't work here, right? So, I don't believe that this is the case. Uh, first of all, yeah, can I tell you, like, sitting here for sure, that this crazy tyrant Putin will not use nuclear power? I can't. And what, uh, what reasons I have to say you? I've given you 100% guarantee. How could I do this? I can't. But I think he will not do this because of number of things. But let us, let us for the moment stop and say, yeah, but if he will do this, it's so awful, so better to appease him, better to give him what he wants. So in this case, it means that the whole world will disappear. There will be just five countries. United States of America, France, United Kingdom, uh, China, and Russian Federation, and mm -hmm. Northern Korea maybe, I don't know. That's all. All other countries should disappear because Putin will say today, I want Ukraine. Oh, no. Nuclear weapons. Okay, tomorrow I want Poland. Then I want Romania. Then I want Kazakhstan. Then I want something else because, but, uh, because I want it. And I have nuclear weaponry. So if it's the way. So that is something unacceptable, I think. Secondly, uh, which I want to remind us, 
uh, like I, we can go to the specific saying that if Russia will do this, there will be response, there will be end of Russia at all, and it will be. So I, I, Putin, even being in, inadequate, he wants to leave, like all dictators. He understands that it will be a suicide for him. I, will, I don't think he will go nukes. But again, it can't be the argument, because if we are accepting it as an argument, the consequences will be awful. One more thing is about Ukrainian history. We have Budapest, Budapest Memorandum in 1994, you know mm -hmm. very good about it, where Ukraine is the only nation in the human history which voluntarily gave up nuclear weaponry, the third biggest arsenal in the world at that moment. Now tell me, what will be the signal for the whole world if after this Ukraine will be defeated, taken territory, people will go through genocide, which is going on? What is the signal? It's a signal to everybody in the world. Go nukes! You should no proliferation, but this is the end of non-proliferation policy as it is. Because all countries will understand, you want to be safe, you, do, you need to have nukes. And then sooner or later, somewhere in the world, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, I don't know, there will be conflict and there will be nuclear weapon reused. Sometime. So if we want really to, to, to stop it, that, that the only way is to restore international law, restore Ukrainian internationally recognized borders, and to fulfill the memorandum, uh, one of guarantors of which was the United States of America. So this is a difficult, this is a difficult topic. Mm -hmm. uh, like we were saying, it was fortunate that in 1945 Hitler didn't have nukes. It's, it is. And it is a problem for the world that Putin today has it. It is. By the way, what is also saying to us that Russia should be denuclearized somewhere in future. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the whole idea of nuclear club is never ever even threaten with this. Mm -hmm. If you are going to this way, it means that you don't deserve the right to have it. And like Ukraine denuclearized, why Russia couldn't de de be denuclearized? I think that that is the objective which should be taken by the free world and reached. So another question uh, along the same lines in the military space is that over the past you know year, Ukraine has uh, moved from being only engaged in defensive action to being willing to take some bolder offensive actions uh, in the territory of the Russian Federation. I think back to the striking of the, the sinking of the Moskva, then the uh, Crimea Bridge, uh, now using drones to attack um, uh, key military bases. And, and I, the, the questioner wants to understand a little bit the evolution of Ukraine's thinking about uh, offensive action in Russia and what might be next in, in those regards. Uh, yeah, first of all, last year Ukraine made uh, two very successful offensive campaigns near Kharkiv, near Kherson, mm -hmm. liberated a big part of our territory. Uh, I want to assure you that you, Ukraine doesn't want any inch of Russian territory. And I don't want to see Ukrainian soldiers dying trying to take Moscow. Moscow and like to burn down Putin on the Red Square. Yeah, it would be pleasant for me. I, I, I don't want to, yeah, to be unfriend with you. But we will not invest our people in this. We just want to liberate our territory. And one important thing, when we're speaking about liberation of territory, it's just not about territory. It's about people, mm -hmm. because now hundreds, thousands of Ukrainians are under genocide, because Russia is committing genocide. I'm speaking it from juridical point of view, not political point of view. If you will take United Nations Charter on Prevention of Genocide, there are five criteria of what is genocide, and all of them are met in Ukraine. First, public announcement that this group, religious, ethnic, does not exist, which Putin says. He's saying, Ukrainians, they do not exist. They, they are Russians, but bad Russians, they should be fixed. Second thing is to destroy, to destroy cultural heritage of the group. That's what they are doing. They are burning our books on the occupied territories, destroying our monuments, everything they can. Third is sexual crimes, and we have it, unfortunately. Raping, mass raping, and so on. Fourth is forceful deportation of people, including children. That's what they're doing. They're taking Ukrainian children, sending them to Russia, giving them to new families in, in order to make from Ukrainians Russians. And the fifth 
is mass murders, and unfortunately we also have it. So all five criteria, like in textbook, mm -hmm. like in textbook, it's a new genocide. And once again, what says United Nations Charter to, on Prevention of Genocide? That all countries which ratified this charter, when they know that genocide is happening, they just not just say they should react and do everything they can to stop it. That's what should be done in Ukraine. So you said you'd be personally happy to see, you know, Putin uh, hanging in Red Square. I guess the question I want to ask you more practically is what can and should be what done? What use? <laughs> <laughs> what can and should be done legally to hold both Putin and the Russian government accountable? Should there be an international criminal trial of Putin? Should there be financial reparations like we saw, say, with the Iran uh, U.S. Claims Commission uh, or between Iraq and Kuwait? Uh, how do we make Ukraine whole and how do we punish those responsible for what's happened? Amazing question. And that is something which people from this audience can do. Because that, is the, that will be a task of your generation. Of, I mean, this war is changing a lot of in the world. And one of things, legal mechanisms. Because now we clearly see that we lack of these mechanisms, but we need them. Because we need tribunal, we need those who committed atrocities to be taken to responsibility. We need tribunal against Putin and he and the and Lukashenko and all the entourage. So that is a very important question. A lot of the brightest minds in juridical sphere, in law, uh, in law now in the world, are now working on this. How this tribunal should be set? What about assets? How it will, should work? And that is very, un, very complicated question. But after we will answer this question, that will be a new chapter in international law, definitely. That will change a lot. So, uh, yeah, we need tribunal because we believe in rule of law. The criminals should be convicted, then they should pay their price. That's how it should happen, but it's very easy to say, but it's mm -hmm. quite complicated to do. But there's something which is a very big task, which many lawyers in the world, the best lawyers in the world can contribute to. I'm going to ask one of the best lawyers in the world sitting to your right to chime yeah. in on that topic. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, so, so, you know, the, the way I look at it is that um, uh, th there are several things that need to be addressed, right? One is how do you uh, hold um, uh, Russian government uh, and as well as people who are actually on the ground perpetrating these crimes, how do they hold them uh, accountable? How do you prosecute atrocities? It's not that easy. We've done a pro bono project on this, prepared very uh, significant analysis, and it's not easy, right? Because under the international law to set up a tribunal that will be able actually to prosecute atrocities, when you go into technicalities of what's required, it's not easy. One of the big impediments actually to setting up international court uh, UN Security Council can set it up, but when you have a permanent member of the UN Security Council that can veto it, you cannot do it. Now, there is an issue which actually we can spend probably entire day talking about, does Russia truly have a proper legal uh, legally uh, but proper seat uh, in the Security Council. Uh, did it truly succeed into that seat uh, to the seat held by the Soviet Union back uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed? And the answer to that is no, right? But again, you know, we, we can discuss it uh, at length. Um, uh, if Russia is not on, on Security Council, um, uh, or uh, you know, we go through other mechanisms, in which case we need to convince a lot of members of the General Assembly uh, uh, to vote for it. You know, we can set up other mechanisms, as uh, you and I discussed uh, before. Similarly, on reparations, it's not an easy. Uh, uh, answer, but that's something that actually people are looking into and need to look into, because at the end of the day, it should not be U.S. taxpayers paying for reparations. Russia should be paying for it. We have frozen assets of um, Russia in the West now, right? But for this, we also need to be, because, you know, we abide by the rule of law. We need to establish proper mechanism. We need to establish, um, uh, you know, who committed it, what com was committed, assess damages, and then making sure that those reparations are paid and assets are converted from frozen to actually being given to, to Ukraine. Complex issues, mm -hmm. uh, but these are the issues that we as a legal community absolutely need to look into and uh, help Ukraine uh, figure out how to deal with this, both on the prosecution of atrocities and on reparations. And may, there are many other legal issues that uh, the legal community is working on. So we're running long time. I have two more questions I want to ask. And 
The first is sort of where does this end? And what I mean by that is Ukraine has done a incredible, I mean, I don't think anyone thought we'd be sitting here today with Ukraine still the sovereign state that it is. I think there are many in this country though who can't quite imagine the Ukrainian military fully defeating the Russian army, pushing them out of Ukrainian territory and out of Crimea. Um, at the same time, everybody wants this war eventually to end. And so I guess the question is, where do you see this war ending and how do we get from here to there? And I know that's an unfair question to ask when I've said time is running low. Yeah, I, I will be short. It's very easy. We need to restore international law. It means to restore Ukrainian sovereignty on all our territories in our internationally recognized borders, including Russia. They recognize borders. So that is the end of the war. Can we win it militarily? Yes. It's a definite answer. We showed it to the whole world that we can do this. But for this, we need instruments. For in our case, that's weaponry. And if we will receive the weaponry that we need now, we will finish everything quite quickly, several months. It's possible. Uh, if not, that will take maybe years. And that will be painful for the whole world, for Ukraine especially, but for the whole world. But the end will be the, the same. We will win. Uh, but the price will be very high, and, and, and the signal to dictators throughout the planet will be not so good as just clear, simple victory. And when is the right time to begin conversations around uh, an end to the war? Obviously, one doesn't want to start negotiating with Putin while he still controls Ukrainian territory, but what are the sort of markers that say it would be time to begin a conversation about some sort of negotiated settlement on the terms you've just laid out? Yesterday. I mean, like, we are ready. The question is, when we, I, I, I've asked this question quite often in media, Western media, that, like, when, why you don't want to have negotiations in Putin? Sometimes it's even framed like this. And I'm saying, who said this? We want negotiations with Putin about Russia retreating from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. if, you, if somebody thinks that we want our children, our brothers, fathers to die instead of just Russia leaving our territory, that's, that's not the case. We just want them to leave. But if... The, the, the subject of negotiations is, is concession of our territories. Just I'm sending you back to what I said about genocide and people. How will we look in the eyes of our children, saying them, you know, we forgot about hundreds of thousands of our compatriots. Let them do with them what they want. So many of the people in the audience here are law students and uh, many more are lawyers. And sometimes when we watch the horrific footage we see from Ukraine, we feel powerless. We don't have the skill sets to provide medical help or to provide military support. Um, and so my question is, what concretely can American law students do to aid this cause? You can do a lot. You can do a lot. Every person matters and everybody can do something, a absolutely. Even by like and share in social media of some information about Ukraine, that is good. If you can reach your congressman and senator or any official saying that they should support Ukraine in this war, that is uh, incredible that you will do this. If you can do in the University of Pennsylvania something, for example, together with our centers, just teaching people in Ukraine, just that is great. because that it's not even about practical part, it's about hope. Mm -hmm. it's a, to give to millions of Ukrainians who are now in such difficult situation, to give a hope that they are not alone. Just, just remind yourself in, in the moments, bad moments in your life. Unfortunately, all, we all had sometimes these moments. What was the most important for you? I, I think that the most important was to, 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 to have someone close to you, maybe mother, maybe father, maybe friend, maybe loved one. That is the most important, just to feel you are not alone. And that what you can show to Ukrainians by any things. You can donate $10 to something in Ukraine. If you want us to help you to do this, you remember QR code, you can find, you can Google, we will help you to do this. So you, there are a lot of ways to do this. And after definitely the war, welcome to Ukraine to invest 
to build a bright, wonderful country, which will be, that, that, that would be the best signal possible for the next generations, when the country which was unjustifiably attacked through with committing genocide, but instead of being destroyed, it became, it, it, it became prosperous, uh, wonderful, people are living there. What can be the best signal for the world that democracy matters, that humankind, that our human, you know, that is something very touching. I can tell you there are things when I'm speaking about them, I can't speak about them like normally. When millions of Ukrainian women and children were leaving the country, running away from the death, like tens of thousands of Polish people, Lithuanian, Romanian people came to the border to meet them and to open the doors of their houses to unknown people. That means that humanity is alive, mm -hmm. that the Western world has values. It's not just about consumerism, it has values which matters. That is something so important. So let us build this brighter future together. Thank you. Thank you. George, do you have anything you want to add to? I, I think I think Oleksy captured it uh, entirely. The, I, I, I must say that you know one of the concerns I'm hearing from my family in Ukraine that we just hope that the world is not going to get tired of this topic uh, and that uh, we will not be abandoned. It's so important what Oleksy said is that we as a world stand up to evil. We show to Ukrainians that actually we support Ukraine. We support the good. We support the values. We all have values. Uh, against what's what's happening. It's uh, unthinkable what's happening. Uh, to your earlier uh, question, Bill, on negotiations, as a professional negotiator, you need to have a willing party on the other side of the table. When the, the other party just wants to dictate uh, and say that we're going to take this territory and this territory and that's our negotiation, it's not negotiations, right? Uh, so that's where, you know, please do stand with Ukraine. Uh, my first um, uh, LinkedIn post on uh, February 24th, very early in the morning, was stand with Ukraine. This is, this is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. Please stand with Ukraine. And I, uh, I'm repeating it today. I'm so grateful that all of you are here and uh, those who are with us uh, on video uh, that you came here. You are willing to uh, and interested in the topic and, and you are supporting. And, you know, I, I really appreciate all of you standing, standing uh, with Ukraine today. Well, what I can say is that we do stand with you Ukraine. Will. And we will be thinking of you and your children and your wife in Odessa. Um, we pray for their safety. But I think we leave today perhaps feeling a little more empowered to act to help ensure their safety. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Um, I've been asked to repeat the second CLE passcode, uh, which appropriately is peace. The second CLE passcode is peace. And I now ask you to join me in thanking uh, Alexei and George, and then invite you to the reception upstairs. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was an honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. God bless America. God bless America. Thank you.